Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome, okay. Um, we are already about four minutes past, so I don't wanna um, hold too many people up, uh, but thank you all for being here today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone who has been supporting the network so far. Um, we're back with our Black and Comp Bio seminar series for this semester, and we have three um, talks for this uh, spring semester here before the end of, I think, March or April. Um, but we've also recently reached our milestone of 200 members within the network which is tremendous for us. I just wanted to thank you all for your support and um, Black Income Bio series seminars have been um, a major part in spreading the word of our community, uh, but also providing a platform for our members to network with so many different researchers, connect with people um, and really engage in science um, and show up as scientists first. So I, I just wanted to um, share my thanks with everyone who supported us and the series. Um, as always, the, uh, this will be recorded and posted onto YouTube, where you can watch um, not only this talk, but all of our past talks as well. And I can go ahead and put the link to our channel in the chat. Um, but today we have a fantastic talk uh, by Dr. David Van Valen, and Melissa will be um, uh, uh, introducing our speaker. Thanks, Janae. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Van Valen. He's an assistant professor of biology um, in biological engineering at Caltech. He got his MD at UCLA and his PhD in applied physics in, at Caltech. And after a postdoc at Stanford, where he focused on deep learning, cell signaling, and live cell imaging, he actually went to industry and worked as a data scientist for a while and um, before he's transitioned to the role that he has now. His group focuses on developing machine learning methods for understanding biophysics at the single cellular level, and he's going to share about what he's been working on. So please help me in, uh, in uh, welcoming Dr. David Van Valen. Thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about my uh, lab's work at the intersection of machine learning and biological imaging. Um, and so the title of this talk is Single Cell Biology in a Software 2.0 World. And if that's um, confusing, and hopefully in a few, uh, in a few slides, um, the title of the talk will, will make sense. Okay, so I'd like to start with a 30,000 foot view um, of how I like to see the intersection of the life sciences and machine learning. Um, and so roughly speaking, you can view uh, biological data as coming in three flavors. Um, there's imaging data, uh, which captures both the spatial and also the temporal variation on a living matter. Um, there's sequence data, uh, which really captures the, the parts list variation um, of living matter. Um, and then there's structural data, um, which really tells us you know, how biological molecules physically interact with the, um, with the physical world. And for each of these different data types now, um, there's arisen a whole community um, of machine learning researchers and also machine learning methods uh, that are meant to operate um, on each of these different data types. And the past few years um, have led to methods that can really do um, some, um, some pretty remarkable things. Uh, for imaging data, um, there are convolutional neural networks. Um, and so these are actually like the focus of uh, today's talk. Um, but for these other data types, there are other methods as well. Um, and so for, uh, for um, sequence data, um, there are a large language models. Um, and so this figure uh, shows a result from one of my favorite papers of 2021. Um, done by Brian Bryson's lab uh, at MIT, where they were able to show that these language models can actually um, predict uh, from viral sequences which sequences are likely to um, escape our immune system. Um, and then for structural data, um, there are equivariant graph neural networks. Um, if you're, uh, I'd say like the best example of, the, of, of this work is the uh, AlphaFold model um, published, uh, published last year, which made rem remarkable progress on uh, the protein folding problem. Uh, problem. And 
So again, today's talk is going to focus um, on uh, convolutional neural networks as applied to uh, imaging data. Um, but I just want to highlight this to just show like the um, you know the the context within which the work I'm going to present today um, is taking place. Um, and I'd also like to uh, just uh, just mention that you know uh, this is what's happening uh, just in the life sciences across every field of science, be it chemistry, material science, or physics. Um, you know, similar sort of revolutions are are, are happening. And I'd say just, just broadly speaking, it's a, it's a really uh, remarkable time to be, uh, to be a scientist. Okay, um, so the deep learning methods uh, that I alluded to, um, namely convolutional networks, are really changing how we interpret biological imaging data. Um, and the reason why they're changing this is that it just, there are key operations that folks want to be able to do with imaging data um, that these new methods are able to do with an accuracy that we just didn't have before. Um, and so some of these uh, operations are shown here on the slide. Um, so for instance, uh, cell segmentation, identifying cells and images, which is also going to be a focus of today's talk. Um, uh, sorry, I think it might be set to, I think the slides might be set to auto advance. Um, yeah, um, so cell segmentation, um, tracking um, biological objects, um, uh, single molecule, uh, analyzing uh, single molecule fish images, um, and also restoring noisy images. And then there's this other, uh, this uh, fifth application, augmented microscopy, which is really interpreting uh, label-free images. Um, so these are just some examples of what can now, of the analyses that can be done um, with, uh, with imaging data. Um, I, I would say, well, um, I, I do want to say like uh, fairly routinely, um, although obviously there, there's, um, you know, details, uh, details still, um, still matter. Um, so this is the, this is the potential uh, of these, of these different methods. And I would say that uh, these methods uh, have been, have, ar have arisen at the same time we've had new advances in, uh, in measurements. Um, and so there are new uh, live cell reporters uh, that exist now that report on, diff on different aspects of cells physiological state. Um, so either measuring uh, the concentration of metabolites or measuring uh, the activity of different uh, signaling pathways. Uh, we've also had advances in multiplexing. Um, and so if you're trying to measure with imaging um, either dozens of different uh, protein concentrations with antibodies or hundreds of different, uh, or, or the expression of hundreds of different genes um, using multiplexed uh, RNA fish. Um, these are also um, new methods that have come available in the last few years. And then we've also had advances in super resolution uh, as well, um, uh, how which you know helped us beat the diffraction limit, and so what I think is happening, um, or what I think is likely, just given the fact that we can measure uh, many more things with imaging, and also given the fact that the algorithms are letting us extract information with images uh, with an accuracy that was previously impossible, I think there's a potential for images to just be a universal data type for uh, for biology. Um, and again, like this, uh, this potential just follows from those two, uh, those two um, technology trends, um, both the fact that we can measure more and that we can make this information um, accessible and interpretable in an, in an interpretable way um, with, uh, you know, with the algorithms. And I think what's really appealing about this uh, from my point of view is that this uh, imaging, you know, really offers the opportunity to integrate information across different modalities. Um, and so an example of this is sort of shown on, on, on the slide, you know, so if you wanted to measure, um, say, signaling dynamics, um, gene expression, and then also the, the localization of different, uh, different proteins, uh, simultaneously um, in the same cell, you can actually do this now with imaging. Um, what you would do is you would put your live cell reporters for different signaling pathways um, into cells. You would then uh, perform live cell imaging to, to record these different signaling uh, dynamics um, in different uh, environmental conditions. And then you'd fix your cells and then do a multiplexed uh, fish and multiplexed immunofluorescence uh, measurement as well. And because all these, and because it's the, literally the same sample um, being imaged uh, for these different assays, you actually get each of these different pieces of information um, all for the same uh, individual cell. Um, and so I think these are the sorts of measurements that I think are becoming possible now, uh, but to really do this well and to really like make this vision uh, reality, you know, what's really needed are computational primitives that perform key computer vision operations and that perform these operations seamlessly across diverse biological imaging data uh, types. Um, and so as an example, you know, let's say like uh, cell segmentation, you know, you'd want to be able to uh, identify cells in these images 
uh, like regardless of where those images came from. So whether you're imaging using light or imaging using mass cytometry, um, whether you're imaging HeLa cells or whether you're imaging cells and tissues, you would want to be able to perform like the same operation across all those diverse, uh, diverse image types. Um, to be a little bit more concrete about, you know, sort of how this would enable us to interpret um, images, uh, I have this, uh, this example that I, uh, that I like. Um, and so here we have a movie um, of a, uh, a neutrophil undergoing chemotaxis and uh, engulfing and digesting a bacteria. And so concretely, what we'd like to be able to do is to have algorithms that will just look at these sort of imaging data and then um, interpret it in a very, uh, in a very similar way to how our brain uh, interprets it and produce the information in a way where it's, uh, it's accessible. Um, and so, you know, in this, uh, you know, in this process, you know, what we'd like to be able to do is a very first step, um, you know, just take this raw data um, and then uh, perform, uh, you know, cell segmentation. So we identify um, all the different cells. Um, so be it these red blood cells here, um, be it these neutrophils or, and also like these uh, bacterial cells that are sort of floating around um, in the background. Um, and so that would convert like this imaging data um, into this process data. And so each cell in this object ends up becoming um, a, a node in this graph. Uh, but then we'd also like to add some semantic information like on top of this, right? So we want to know that these uh, that cells aren't just cells, but they're red blood cells um, that uh, you know neutrophils are neutrophils and that these bacterial cells are actually um, bacterial cells. Uh, but then we'd also like to be able to capture the fact that there's this interaction called vagocytosis between, um, the neutrophil and the bacterial um, cells as well, uh, as well. And so you can sort of see from this process of taking like the imaging data and, and converting into something that's actually um, interpretable, um, like the spatial temporal graph, you know, you need these computational primitives to actually be able to do that, right? So there's a need to do like the cell segmentation, there's a need to perform uh, cell tracking. So you have these temporally um, consistent objects. Um, and then once you have that, then you can um, start uh, adding in the semantic information. Um, the computational primitives are sort of a key um, a key element of, of being able to do this. Okay, um, I, I like to call this uh, I like to call this sort of like a, a uh, Tesla autopilot uh, for biological imaging. You know, because really that's what Tesla autopilot does for um, you know this, the the camera data collected uh, to do the, the to do like the the self driving. Okay, um, and so this is what we'd like to have. Um, the reality is we don't we don't have that yet. And the question is, okay, why don't we have that yet? Um, and I think uh, just stepping back uh, a little bit, uh, the reason why we don't have that is because uh, we don't have these uh, algorithms that are able to perform these computational primitives in just a very, uh, in a very general way across diverse data uh, image sets is that um, the biological imaging and uh, AI, they're, uh, and these deep learning methods are sort of in what I like to call this Tico Brahe era um, of their relationship. And so what I mean by that is as follows. Um, so everybody, uh, really most folks are aware of Johannes Kepler, um, a steam, uh, famous astronomer. Um, you know, everybody learns about him as laws of motions when they take uh, freshman physics. Uh, fewer people are aware of uh, Tycho Brahe. Um, and so what Tycho Brahe did um, was he took uh, meticulous notes on both the location um, and the identities of planets and stars literally compiled over decades. Um, and it was really this data center effort that Tycho Brahe undertook that enabled uh, Kepler's uh, generation of these general um, these general laws of motion of the planets, and just really just this general um, insight, uh, or sorry, this general insight um, into how these physical objects behave. Um, and so it's really, you know, you really can't have one without the other. Um, and it's really in this Tycho Brahe era um, that the relationship between deep learning and biological imaging is in. Um, there's just a deep need to both uh, collect, um, annotate, uh, curate, and annotate um, large sets of biological imaging um, data. And if we don't do that, then we're never going to get um, the you know, general purpose uh, you know, computational algorithms um, that everybody um, knows that we need and everybody really, uh, really wants. Okay, um, and so that's what leads us to software um, Software 2.0. Um, so Software 2.0 um, is a term coined by Andre Karpathy, who's currently the head of AI at Tesla, which just calls attention to the reality that if you want to get deep learning methods to work in practice, you actually need much more than just the deep learning methods themselves. Um, as I uh, described in the, in the previous slide, um, these new deep learning methods are powered by data. Um, and so they learn how to perform their uh, particular task 
um, from labeled data sets. And so if you don't have a labeled data set, then the models don't have anything to learn from. Um, and so labeled data is an integral part of developing these methods. Uh, you need the compute the deep learning methods themselves. Uh, and then you also need computational infrastructure, both for model training, um, but also for model deployment, um, so that these models can actually be used by the folks uh, who are performing uh, the biological discovery. Um, and so at each of these different, uh, each of these different uh, uh, silos that you need, um, so the data, the models and compute, um, there are challenges that, uh, uh, that await us. And so I would say like uh, here, I just have a list of some of the challenges I think are important, um, not, not all of them. Um, so on the data side, um, you know, thinking about how can we label um, imaging data efficiently um, is a really important problem. Uh, on the model side, thinking about which model architectures actually provide enough accuracy to solve your problem. Um, and then also thinking about how we can manage the uh, trade-off between model accuracy and model um, inference speed. Um, and then um, on the uh, sort of compute, but also the compute uh, models and data side, you know, thinking about how we can actually integrate these models into complete pipelines um, that can be scaled uh, to large uh, to large data sets. Um, so I think these four questions are, you know, uh, there's progress has been made, and I think I'm going to uh, outline some of the progress my lab, my my own lab has made on them. But I think these are big problems that are just facing um, the field of researchers who are working um, working in this space. Um, so with that said, um, I'd like to share some of the stories um, uh, that my lab is working on. Um, and, I, and before I do it, I'd just like to highlight um, some of the folks who've actually executed um, the work. And so a lot of the work that you're, uh, sorry, I think this, uh, yeah, so a lot of the work that you're going to see today has been spearheaded um, by uh, Geneva Miller, a research technician in my lab, um, Eric Moen, a postdoctoral fellow, and then also uh, Noah Greenwald, um, who's a graduate student with Michelangelo Stanford. Um, and then you're also going to see work uh, from other lab members, uh, Morgan Schwartz, um, and I'm allowed to two graduate students um, who've been working on new deep learning methods. Um, Nitsan Razin is a former postdoc. Um, you'll see some of her work as well. Um, Dylan Bannon is a former graduate student, um, and then Tom Dougherty and William Graff. Um, our two software engineers um, who've been working in our lab, um, really helping us make uh, convert the algorithms that we designed into uh, scalable and usable software. Um, okay, and so this section um, is uh, about data models and, uh, and compute, and is really about interpreting biological imaging data uh, with single cell resolution uh, at scale. And so single cell analysis is a common uh, challenge for biological imaging experiments. Um, and so we actually, uh, we have a wet lab. Um, and so folks in the wet lab um, do live cell imaging to try to understand how cells perceive both themselves and also their environment. So in these experiments, um, you take cells, you throw in fluorescent reporters for different signaling pathways. Um, you then put the cells on a microscope, um, collect images over time. You'll get movies like this. And then the analysis that you have to do um, is you have to identify every cell um, in every frame, um, link them together over time, and then you know, analyze either the uh, location or the abundance of fluorescence um, over time. If you're able to do that, then you can convert these raw, uh, these raw movies um, into interpretable um, data like this. Um, and so here we sort of see um, these traces of activity for every cell. Um, I like to think of this as a um, cell signaling version of a patch clamp because each trace sort of tells you, um, you know, what the cell is thinking about uh, its environment. Uh, we are also interested in how these different patterns of signaling uh, uh, dynamics are converted into um, gene expression. And so we'll do um, endpoint um, multiplexed fish to be able to uh, measure gene expression um, in these same cells that we're measuring the signaling dynamics. And so to interpret these data sets, um, one key thing that you have to be able to do is just identify um, the single molecule spots that correspond to um, mRNA transcripts. Uh, single cell analysis is also a challenge for uh, multiplexed imaging uh, experiments. And so there are new imaging platforms that can um, both stain and image uh, tissues with dozens of different antibodies all at the same time. Uh, these methods work in either one of two ways. Either you're doing um, iterative uh, rounds of staining, imaging, and then de-staining um, with light, or you're uh, conjugating uh, different mass tags uh, to your antibodies and then you're imaging using mass cytometry. It turns out you have to do one of these two things to get around the problem of spectral overlap um, when you're imaging with light. Uh, these methods are you know, really opening new windows into the biology of both healthy and disease tissues. Um, here we have a, um, some example, uh, examples of what some of this data looks like um, taken from this uh, paper uh, that Liak, Fred, and Michelangelo um, published on Cell a couple of years ago, where they're using uh, one of these multiplexed imaging methods to profile uh, the 
um, the immune cells in triple negative breast cancer. And so here we see data from four different patients um, and seven different uh, antibody markers. Um, and you know, each marker tells you something different um, about, the, about the tissue. Um, so for example, CD45 will tell you where all the immune cells are. Um, EGFR and P53 will report on the state of different cancer cells. Uh, the point isn't to uh, double-stranded DNA um, tells you where the cell nuclei are. Um, the point isn't to harp on each, uh, any one of these different markers, but rather just to say that there's a lot of them and each one tells you something um, biologically, uh, biologically meaningful. Um, so these data are very rich, but analyzing it's very challenging. And one of the very first things that, uh, that's typically done for these data is you have to identify um, where all the cells are in your image. And so you'll typically go to one of the structural images um, like here, um, the image of double of the antibody against double-stranded DNA, um, and you know, computationally um, or manually, someone has to go through and identify. Okay, um, these pixels belong to cell number one. These belong to cell number two, three, four, five, six, um, and so on, um, so on and so forth. If you're able to do that, um, then for every cell, you can then ask how much of each marker is it is expressing, and then you can use that information to then go and you know do things like determine cell type. Um, determine spatial relationships um, and link these uh, link these uh, spatial patterns uh, to patient uh, to patient um, outcomes. Um, outcomes. Okay, um, and so uh, as you can see, the single cell uh, being able to identify um, cells in these images uh, sort of forms the core of all these analyses. And there's just been a problem with most of the analysis, with almost all the analyses that have been done um, for these sort of data to date. And this includes um, analyses that my own lab has done. Uh, and that's that the, um, they use the nucleus as a proxy for the whole cell. Um, this is usually done because, you know, the cell nuclei are, tend to be ubiquitous. And from the analysis point of view, um, their morphology is more constrained than the morphology of uh, whole cells. And so the analysis problem becomes uh, somewhat easier, uh, but it's just problematic for a while for several reasons. Uh, one is that, you know, most markers are not nuclear. And so if you're using the nucleus as a proxy for the whole cell, uh, your quantification just ends up being um, inaccurate. Um, but then also there are sorts of, there are sets of analyses that you'd like to be able to do that you just can't do if you're using the nucleus as a proxy for the whole cell. Um, and so two of those uh, include, um, you know, analyzing the subset of localization of proteins, um, and then also analyzing um, cell morphology. Um, and so what's really needed um, in this space are algorithms that can perform both nuclear and whole cell segmentation and that perform uh, reliably across all of the different imaging platforms that people um, are using and also across all of the, all of the different um, data uh, tissue types that people are uh, collecting data for. Okay, um, and so that's what's needed. Um, so that's what's needed for the tissue culture um, sets of uh, experiments, um, for the live imaging experiments. You know, what's needed are algorithms that can do both the cell segmentation, but also the cell tracking. Um, that's what's required. The question is, how do we get there? Um, and you know, we uh, we feel in our lab that the path to actually um, generating these performant, uh, these general purpose and performant models is through uh, building the underlying data sets. Um, and this just stems from a observation that we've made over the past a few years, but oftentimes the reason why models don't perform well on imaging data is uh, oftentimes like the imaging data either A, doesn't exist, or B, the data, the imaging data, data that does exist doesn't have the information necessary to perform our desired task. Um, for um, multiplexed imaging experiments of tissues, this issue arises a lack of contrast um, between neighboring cells and tissues. And for live cell imaging data, this arises a lack of temporal information um, in the available uh, image, uh, imaging data um, that's been uh, annotated to data. It just, it just so happens that most of the labeled data um, has been done of static snapshots, um, very few data uh, where folks have uh, actually labeled entire movies exist. Um, and much of that data has actually been generated um, by our lab. And so an, an example of what I'm talking about of uh, improving um, model performance by, uh, by actually improving the information content um, of the training data is shown here on this slide. Um, and so here we have uh, images of cell nuclei. And so what you can do is you can label images like this, and then you can train deep learning methods to identify the boundaries between uh, cells. Um, and then you can take that, that those models and then run it on um, exactly this uh, this image. And what you'll do if you get that, if, what you'll get if you do that, um, are images that look like this. And so what you'll see is that you know there are some uh, there's some regions that where the models perform uh, fairly well. And so these are like these bright white outlines uh, identifying this, the boundary of cells. But you'll also see there are all of these gray regions. Um, 
here uh, at the uh, what looks like the insides of cells. And these gray regions represent um, areas of uncertainty where the model just isn't sure, uh, is this like inside of a cell or is this part of the part of the cell boundary? Um, and the reason why it's not sure is just because the images themselves lack the contrast required to make that uh, determination. Uh, what you can do if you're doing a multiplexed imaging experiment uh, is you can add a stain that adds that contrast back in. Um, and so, for example, you can stay, add a stain that targets a nuclear envelope, um, and then you can train models. Uh, you can make that information available to the, um, to the deep learning models. Um, and so then if you take a model, if you then take said, um, said model um, and then run it over this image, um, again, including the, uh, uh, including the stain um, of the nuclear envelope, uh, same model, same model architecture, same training parameters. The only difference is that now it has access to both the nuclear image and the nuclear envelope image. Um, then the result is uh, our images that look like this. And so what you'll see is that, you know, almost miraculously, um, all the, uh, almost all these gray areas of uncertainty um, magically disappear. Um, and so that's really what I'm talking about, uh, what I'm talking about is that the, the path to pr producing these robust um, general purpose models um, is by building data sets where the images themselves uh, actually contain the information uh, to resolve most of the ambiguities of what you're trying to do. Um, and so here we arrive at their first story. Um, and so working with uh, Michelangelo's lab at Stanford, we set out to solve the problem of both nuclear and whole cell segmentation um, in tissues using deep learning. And so the very first part uh, step of doing this um, was building a data set um, for, uh, for tissue imaging. Um, the ability to, uh, to multiplex, um, again, means that we can actually collect images that have the necessary structural information so that we can reliably perform the segmentation. Um, and so in building this data set, um, we compile data across all the different platforms and across a, a wide variety of different, um, sorry, uh, in, uh, uh, tissues that are being imaged. And as we did this, we made sure that each data set had both a nuclear image and then also an image of a membrane or cytoplasm marker um, as well. And again, like if we wanted to do both, both nuclear and whole cell segmentation, we need to have both sets of, uh, both sets of images. Um, and so after compiling this data from different uh, members of the community, um, the image annotation uh, was, the next, uh, was the next major challenge. Um, and so just to uh, show you um, how difficult this is, I'd like to um, show it a, uh, a montage of images. Um, and so here we have six different images across different uh, tissues and disease states, um, and also across different imaging platforms. And so here we have uh, melanoma from the multiplex IMB imaging platform, um, as well as histologically normal GI tissues from the multiplex imaging uh, multiplexed ion beam imaging platform. Uh, and then we also have um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, breast cancer, um, histologically normal colon, and then small cell lung cancer uh, from different uh, imaging platforms that uh, use a variety of, of uh, immunofluorescence. And just visually speaking, uh, you can see that this is a hard, um, hard problem. Um, cell morphology varies considerably, uh, both uh, within and across different tissues. Uh, the signal to noise and autofluorescence characteristics varies across imaging platforms. Um, in some tissue cells are dispersed, uh, other tissue cells are di uh, densely packed. And then in a variety of tissues, most notably the GI tissues, um, you know, some cells don't even uh, appear to have cell nuclei. And this is an artifact of taking a two-dimensional, of imaging to a two-dimensional cross-section um, of a three-dimensional object, just sometimes the, uh, the imaging plane misses the cell nucleus. And so this is hard. Um, and I just show this, I like showing this slide just to visually uh, uh, show um, how challenging this is. This is. Um, so to do the labeling, um, we knew that we actually were going to need to use crowdsourcing. Um, and there, unfortunately, um, at the time that we started, uh, you know, there wasn't really good software tools um, to, facil to facilitate um, distributed labeling um, of this sort of data. And so we actually uh, made our own. Um, and so we built this tool called Deep Cell Label, um, which is browser-based software for distributed labeling of large biological imaging image collections. Um, it's designed to enable, um, you know, scalable labeling. Um, and so the way this, uh, the software is engineered, um, there's a backend um, that serves uh, images um, and then also the existing label arrays uh, to, uh, to the front end. Um, annotators, you know, can then uh, interface with the data, perform labeling operations, either create labels from scratch or edit existing labels. Um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to make that, uh, make that step as um, easy and as painless as, um, as possible. Um, and then, you know, edits that are made um, are then sent to the back end to update the update the label array. Um, and this back end uh, that serves the serves the, uh, the images and the labels, uh, this is hosted um, on a, uh, a scalable uh, cloud service on, 
on Amazon. Uh, we use uh, Elastic Beanstalk on Amazon Web Service. And by scalable, what I mean is that if you start having uh, more and more users uh, interacting with the collection of imaging data, um, then you end up getting a, a larger and larger and larger server um, to, make, to make sure that the uh, responsiveness uh, uh, is, um, is intact. Um, and so with this software, um, we're then able to go and label um, this large uh, collection of data. Um, and the next thing that we, had, uh, that we had to think of was how to do it in a, uh, in a scalable uh, way. And so what we ended up uh, arriving on was a human of the loop approach to uh, image labeling um, where humans, experts, uh, sorry, uh, experts, crowdsource workers, um, also humans, and then also the AI models themselves all work collaboratively to build a data set um, rather than working individually. Um, and so the way this, uh, this framework works is as follows. And so in the very first step, um, an expert um, takes uh, a representative a sample of the uh, image data, um, lab both, uh, performs some labeling, um, both to define the labeling task and then also to create a um, early preliminary model. Um, this model is able to perform okay, but it does make a fair number of errors, and that's just because it just hasn't seen enough um, examples to learn how to um, not um, not make mistakes. Um, once, excuse me, um, once this early model is made, um, it's then passed off to the second um, to the second phase, and so here crowdsource workers create new labels um, by correcting model errors, and so to create a to label um, an image. Um, this image is first passed through this preliminary model, predictions are made, um, there are errors, these predictions are then sent to uh, a collection of crowdsourced workers, and these workers, uh, using instructions provided by the experts, uh, fix, those, uh, fix those errors. Um, the results are then uh, sent back, um, the experts look over it and perform quality control. Um, and then the final result is then uh, this a piece, a additional piece of uh, training data that can be uh, added to the uh, original pile of training data. Um, and so the cycle repeats um, until a point where uh, it makes sense to uh, both retrain and update the, uh, update the model. Um, and then the cycle repeats, uh, except now you're using this newer, uh, more accurate model uh, as, the, as the source of the, of the predictions. Um, and so what ends up happening in this cycle is, in this process, is, is that you end up in a virtuous cycle um, that dramatically reduces the marginal cost of annotation um, as your labeling project proceeds. Um, because what ends up happening is that the, the model ends up seeing um, more data. Um, and so that means it becomes more accurate. Uh, when it's, uh, because it's more accurate, uh, it makes fewer errors. Um, and this means that the crowdsource workers um, you know, have less work to do, which means that you have to pay them um, less for each image that you, uh, that you annotate. Um, it also means that the experts have to spend less time performing quality control as well, um, because again, the model is performing, uh, is, is making like fewer and fewer errors. Um, and so if you let this repeat long enough, uh, then eventually you get to phase three, um, where you can act where you have this uh, large pile um, of uh, high quality training data, and then you can just train a final model um, on this uh, data set and then release it um, to the community uh, where it can be uh, where it can be used. Um, and so this work was recently published in Nature, um, in Nature Biotechnology. Uh, a link to the preprint um, is shown here on this slide. Okay. Um, yeah, so we ran this process um, on uh, this uh, collection of tissue imaging data um, to create a data set that we call TissueNet, um, which is an image net for multiplex tissue imaging. Uh, it's the uh, largest uh, collection of its kind. Um, so it contains uh, data from six different imaging platforms and nine different tissues um, across uh, three different um, disease states, um, histologically normal, um, cancerous, and then also um, infectious. Uh, and it it's also the, I don't know also, but it's the largest collection um, of its kind. So uh, TissueNet contains approximately um, 1.2 million whole cell annotations, um, as well as uh, all about 1.2 uh, uh, paired nuclear annotations as well. Um, and then comparing uh, TissueNet to uh, the public, to the uh, some total of publicly available training data um, at the that was available at the time that we started this project. Um, TissueNet contains a pro uh, contained approximately um, 16 times as many whole cell uh, labels and about twice as many um, nuclear labels um, as well. Um, creating it uh, took about 4,000 uh, person hours, uh, but because we're performing this in this uh, distributed, uh, but because we're performing the labeling in this distributed way, um, much of this time was spread was spread across. Uh, collection of crowdsourced uh, workers. Um, and the actual amount of labeling time that the experts had to do um, was fairly, uh, was, you know, non-trivial, but was uh, fairly, uh, fairly limited. Uh, with TissueNet, um, we're, we're then able to create Mesmer, which is a deep learning um, 
pipeline for both nuclear and whole cell segmentation. Um, it works by predicting both the uh, centroid of each cell um, as well as the boundary. Um, and for each cell, um, it produces both a nuclear prediction as well as a whole cell prediction. Um, I, I would like to highlight that you know, Mesmer sort of places this deep learning um, in this larger pipeline that performs both you know, image normalization um, and then tiling and untiling um, so that you can uh, perform predictions on large images. And I just highlight this because you know, I think that the complete, that complete solutions you know, do require more than just the deep learning. Um, it's this entire pipeline that provides value to users, not just the deep learning model. Um, and so uh, I would like to walk you through a visual tour of some of the results um, because I think they're, they're quite nice. Um, and so here we have an image of a pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma collected with the Codex platform. Um, and here, these white outlines are the predictions of where uh, whole cells exist um, in, this, uh, in this image. And so you can just see visually speaking, uh, you know, Mesmer works like uh, fairly well and is, even to, is able to segment cells um, even when the cell nuclei um, isn't, um, isn't present using the visual cues from the membrane, uh, from the membrane stain. Um, here we have a slide showing one of Mesmer's uh, best features, which is its ability to generalize uh, this analysis, or sorry, this ability to perform this analysis um, across a wide array of different tissue types, uh, disease states, imaging platforms. And so here we have a collection of different uh, images from different tissue types and uh, imaging platforms. And then here we have the predictions uh, produced by Mesmer. Um, and so the, the way these uh, predictions are visualized, um, each uh, segmentation prediction is colored by the, rel by the relative error um, in cell size. So if cells are predicted to be too big, um, then they're colored red. And if they're predicted to be too small, they're colored, um, they're colored blue. Um, most cells uh, here are uh, sort of uh, uh, White, um, which highlights that we're getting most of them uh, accurately, uh, segmented accurately. Um, and then we also have uh, the associated um, F1 score as well, which is a, a measure of segmentation quality. Um, it ranges between zero to one. One is near perfect segmentation, zero is uh, uh, missing everything. Um, and around uh, F1 scores around like 0.7 to 0.8, you start getting uh, segmentation results that are, uh, that are viable. Um, for uh, you know, for publication quality analyses, and we see here that you know Mesmer is able to uh, perform segmentation accurately um, across all of these different uh, types of images. So whether you're looking at images from uh, breast cancer or lung cancer or histologically normal um, skin or esophagus, um, or even in uh, you know densely packed uh, you know tuberculosis nodules, um, as long as you have like a decent uh, nuclear image and a decent uh, membrane or, or whole cell stain, Mesmer is able to segment, um, segment them uh, fairly, uh, fairly accurately. Um, in fact, we were so impressed with Mesmer's performance, we actually went ahead and did the effort to compare um, Mesmer's performance to human performance. And there are a couple analyses that we did that are highlighted in our paper, um, one of them comparing, um, you know, uh, annotator Mesmer agreement with the act with the agreement uh, between different uh, human annotators. Um, and then another uh, a comparison we did where we asked pathologists to evaluate um, both uh, Mesmer's uh, perform uh, Mesmer's predictions and a uh, human annotator um, predictions um, in a blinded fashion. Um, and in both of those analyses, what we found was that uh, there wasn't any significant difference between uh, Mesmer's outputs um, and human outputs. Um, so here, um, you know, this is just showing uh, the uh, analysis provided by uh, the uh, the board certified pathologists. Uh, you know, and what they what they um, re reported was that you know there's really no strong preference um, for predictions produced by Mesmer um, or predictions produced by uh, humans. And that's true whether you look at the um, evaluation data in aggregate or if you break it out um, by um, by tissue type. Uh, with Mesmer, um, you know, we can now uh, actually uh, construct uh, spatial cell atlases of human tissues in a scalable way. Um, and so here we, uh, you know, um, here just highlights that with Mesmer, um, you can, uh, you know, perform cell clustering, uh, cell type clustering um, on these uh, uh, tissue data sets. Uh, it does this, the clustering um, does still have a manual component, but it's much easier and much uh, more straightforward um, with the accurate um, segmentations produced by Mesmer. Um, here we just see that the different counts produced uh, if you're using uh, Mesmer annotation, Mesmer produced annotations um, or human annotations at these two counts uh, line up uh, quite nicely. Um, Mesmer, Mesmer is also able to uh, uh, let you perform uh, subcellular localization analyses. Um, and so here we see um, different markers. Um, so KS67 is a predominantly nuclear marker, CD44, uh, HER2 are predominantly expressed um, on the membrane. And because Mesmer produces uh, predictions for both where the cell nuclei are and where the uh, whole cell compartment is, you know, it's relatively straightforward just to ask, okay, well, how much signal 
um, for a given marker is in the nucleus versus um, in, the, in the whole cell compartment. Um, and, you know, not surprisingly, um, Mesmer, you know, produces predictions, uh, produces results that make sense um, when in compared to like what our eye, what our eyes tell us. And that's that, you know, for nuclear markers, the most of the signal is in the nucleus and that for, um, you know, non-nuclear markers, you know, most of the signal is not, uh, is not in the nucleus. Um, what's really nice though, is that Mesmer is able to do this in, a, um, in an automated fashion um, with single cell resolution. Um, whereas, you know, before, you know, the sort of uh, scoring would have to be done manually uh, by uh, either graduate students, postdocs or pathologists. Okay, um, there's a story um, about uh, where, we're, where we show that we're able to use Mesmer to, to analyze cell morphology. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go over that uh, today, um, but that's, uh, that's highlighted uh, in, the, uh, in the Nature Biotechnology paper. Um, so our lab's been hard at work with the last couple of years, uh, creating a similar resource for live cell, uh, live cell imaging. Um, and so here, what we're trying to do um, is annotate um, both uh, nuclear and then cytoplasmic, either fluorescence or you know, label-free methods like phase microscopy. Um, we're trying to label um, entire movies um, of commonly used cell lines um, in imaging. Um, and, uh, you know, this work is still ongoing, um, but the size of our, uh, of our label data is, you know, quickly approaching um, the, size, uh, the size of tissue net. Um, and so I want to say we, you know, we, uh, a couple months ago, we definitely passed the, you know, half a million um, uh, segmentation mark. Um, and so with these uh, segmentation models, uh, sorry, with these uh, labeled movies, not only can we generate models for doing cell segmentation, but we can also generate models for doing um, cell tracking. Um, so the way that our cell tracking uh, model works is that, you know, we try to, we frame it as a classification problem. And so if you have cells in frame I and we have cells in frame I plus one, you know, what we try to uh, predict is that, okay, if we make a comparison between um, these two cells, you know, can we determine whether these are the same cell, whether they're a different cell or whether there's a mother daughter relationship. Um, and so this deep learning model uh, takes an information about you know, what the cells look like, um, what their uh, morph morphological features uh, look like, um, you know, how they're moving, um, so where they are um, in these images. And then it uses this information um, in combination with graph neural networks to model um, the interactions between, um, between cells um, to, make, uh, to, make this uh, to make these predictions. Um, and so, you know, we're still, again, this is still like ongoing work, uh, but our, um, our early versions um, of this model uh, have shown that they're able to do, uh, uh, well, that we can do both uh, nuclear segmentation um, and then also uh, uh, nuclear tracking um, fairly accurately. Um, and so here, you know, the way this, uh, uh, yeah, so the way this uh, movie is interpreted, um, every, every cell gets a uh, unique ID. And so when you see like a cell uh, maintain its uh, color over time, um, that's demonstrating, that's highlighting, that's been uh, tracked accurately. Um, and so when cells divide, um, you know, because you get two new cells, um, you see um, two new cells appear with uh, two different, uh, two new colors. Um, and, uh, you know, you just have to, you know, trust me that, you know, when the cells divide, that we actually are um, capturing, recording the lineage information uh, that we do. Okay, um, and so currently right now what we're working on uh, are two different, are two things. Um, so one, uh, we, were, we wanna make sure that we're actually annotating on the edge cases. Um, so the, the textbook story that, you know, one cell turns into two, um, that's not what you see when you're uh, imaging um, these uh, transformed cell lines uh, with live cell imaging. Um, sometimes you'll have one cell turn into three, sometimes you'll have it turn, uh, one cell turns into two, uh, then back into one and then into two or three. Um, and so making sure that we actually um, are, are, that our annotation framework is um, robust enough to be able to handle these edge cases. Um, you know, that's one thing that we're working on. And then we're also working on, uh, you know, pipelines that can do both uh, whole cell um, segmentation and tracking um, using label-free uh, imaging modalities like phase microscopy. Okay, um, uh, on to other computational primitives. I think that, um, you know, that story uh, focused on doing uh, cell segmentation. Um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we do a lot of uh, single molecule fish in our lab. And so we want to have, uh, you know, methods that can, that can uh, convert uh, the multiplex single molecule fish data um, into uh, gene expression data, um, you know, both uh, uh, accurately, um, robustly, and scalably. Um, and so just as a refresher for those who, who are less familiar, um, the way these uh, multiplex fish assays work is you'll have a sample, um, you'll have fish probes that target different genes, um, and you'll then uh, stain your sample um, across uh, for multiple rounds. And so you'll have your sample, um, you'll stain with a subset of probes, um, you'll image, 
um, you'll then remove the fluorescence and then you'll stain again. And so you'll have these multiple rounds where each round you have probes that are targeting different genes. Um, and so then, you know, you, what you need to do on the analysis side um, is you need to take these images across different rounds. Um, you need to identify um, spots in each round. Um, you then need to align these spots um, and, and then, uh, you know, and then, you know, take these aligned spots, go into, a, go into your code book, um, and then uh, decode um, these identified spots into actual genes. Um, and so each gene, you know, sort of has a, uh, based on the experimental design, um, you know, each gene will have a signature of which rounds uh, you'd expect it to, uh, to appear and, you know, what color it should be um, in, each of those, in each of those rounds. Um, and so a big problem um, in, this, uh, in this analysis pipeline um, is the actual spot detection. Um, a general purpose spot detector um, that can go into these single molecule data um, and then, you know, detect the spots and then do so um, across uh, for a variety of different, uh, you know, tissue types and a variety of different, um, you know, microscopes and hence, you know, point spread functions. Um, you know, that sort of general purpose uh, spot detector has been elusive. And I'd say it's not because um, the deep learning methods like can't do it. Um, it. It has much more to do with the with the data. Um, there's unfortunately, you know, these uh, these single molecule fish data sets uh, produce so many spots that it's just impossible for a human being to ever go through um, and, um, and and annotate them. Um, and so the question is like, okay, if you can't generate, uh, if you can't have humans manually generate a ground truth, um, what do you do? Um, and so one of my students, Emily, um, has been working on this problem for the last couple of years. And she's come up with an approach, which I think is like fairly clever, uh, which uses weekly supervised deep learning to perform um, the spot, to, 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 um, to create models that perform spot detection. Um, and so what Emily uh, sort of figured out is that, okay, well, I may not be able to manually uh, generate ground truth, um, but what I can do is, you know, take a collection of the different classical algorithms that perform spot detection. Um, these are able to perform like reasonably well, um, but each one requires manual fine tuning for um, for data uh, to a particular data set to get a result that can to get uh, predictions that you can actually use. And so what Emily uh, figured out is that, you know, okay, you know, I can actually take a collection of all these different algorithms. Um, I can take some representative data, um, and then I can fit each algorithm um, to these to this uh, representative image collection um, to produce a um, a set of uh, quote unquote annotations um, from each algorithm. Um, and so here, you know, we have these algorithms one through n. Um, each one is manually fit to this collection of data, and so then, you know, for each image, now now you have this uh, set of n different annotations. Um, and then what you can do is that you can perform uh, generative modeling uh, to find consensus annotations. So finding spots where these n different algorithms uh, actually agree. Um, and so then what you can then do um, is you can then take uh, the output of this general uh, this generative modeling on um, these consensus annotations, and then you can use them to train um, deep learning models uh, to perform the uh, to perform to perform spot detection. Um, and so it just so happens that this uh, works like really well. Um, and so here's an example of what some of the uh, predictions look like. Um, so here you'll have a raw image. Um, these models produce uh, two predictions. Uh, so one is a classification. Does a pixel contain a spot? Or does it not contain a spot? Um, and then it also produces regression predictions um, so that you can get sub-pixel resolution um, from, uh, from the model. Um, and so then doing some simple thresholding and applying and then using the output of the, of the regressions, uh, regression predictions um, you can then, uh, you know, identify um, the different spots present uh, in this, uh, in this, in this image. Um, yeah, um, and so what Emily's working on now um, is, you know, actually taking the spot detection model in combination uh, with our cell segmentation models, and then producing complete integrated pipelines that can take in um, both, uh, you know, seg uh, images for uh, that serve as segmentation markers, um, and then also the raw multiplexed uh, fish data. Um, identify the spots, align spots, um, assign those spots to uh, cells that have been segmented, um, and then um, convert like the, um, the identified uh, spots to actual um, gene count tables uh, for, each, uh, for each cell. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and so that, as you saw from that slide, um, that work uh, is looking, it's right. Again, um, 
still ongoing, but the, the results look uh, very, very promising. Um, we've also been working on methods for uh, deploying these models um, at scale using um, you know, cloud native software. Um, and so this is work that was recently described uh, in a Nature Methods paper that we published uh, last year. Um, this, uh, yeah, and so this software uh, we feel like is going to serve as a uh, sort of blast for cellular image analysis. Um, and the idea behind this is that let's say that you have an algorithm that actually can perform uh, these sort of computational primitives uh, in a general uh, way, and so it can perform it on a, on a wide variety of different imaging data. You know, to make this model available, you can actually just take the model, or rather the complete pipeline um, that contains the model, um, make it available uh, through uh, on a on a cloud server. And the way that people would interact now with this model is that they would just take their imaging data, submit it to this uh, centralized web service, and then uh, get the results, uh, get the analysis results back. Um, and so this Nature Methods paper um, sort of outlines um, our software our software that we built that does this. And a really nice feature of the software um, is that because we made it, we built it, um, you know, using, uh, you know, in a cloud native way. Um, so it was designed like from scratch to leverage uh, what you can do with uh, the modern cloud computing services. Uh, we can actually scale uh, the cluster size uh, with the analysis demand. Um, and so if you have more and more users uh, submitting, um, submitting images, then you can just request a bigger and bigger and bigger cluster. Um, and so the paper sort of outlines um, how we build it um, and how we uh, design the scaling to be done so that it's both uh, dynamic, um, but also, uh, but also uh, affordable. Okay. Um, and so I think this is my last, uh, my last research slide. And I think, yeah, and so this is just, highlighting one of the things that I think is like the most exciting. Um, and so what I presented on today was all the labeling, um, all the labeling work in the software structure we've been, uh, we've been developing uh, for tissue images um, of human and also mouse tissues, um, and then also for uh, the live cell imaging uh, data sets. Um, but there's a whole host of imaging data that's generated uh, both in like, you know, cryo EM, uh, or, you know, imaging like other samples, you know, like bacteria or archaea. And so there's a question of like, what are we going to do for those sorts of data, you know, where, you know, this sort of, you know, large, you know, almost industrial scale effort like, hasn't been applied. Um, the thing that's the most exciting um, that, well, one thing that I'm very excited about um, is that, you know, by using this human in the loop framework uh, towards image labeling, uh, we've actually gotten the, the cost of data annotation down to the point where if we had to do a tissue net um, again, um, the cost is actually on par with that of a single uh, sequencing experiment. Um, and so the way you can compute the cost is you can just take the total uh, number of hours, which is about 4,000 hours, and then multiply it by um, the cost of a uh, crowdsourced worker on one of the, on a, um, on one of the uh, crowdsourcing platform, uh, platforms we use, which is about you know, around $6, uh, $6 an hour. Um, and so you know, back in the above calculation it gives you about twenty dollars to $30,000 uh, to generate uh, of crowdsourcing costs to generate um, the next data set. Um, and so this might sound like a lot of money, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things um, for, you know, the life science experiments, this actually isn't that much money um, at all. And when you compare the value that's derived from these sort of models uh, with the cost required to like generate the training data sets to power the models, you know, this is almost like a, a no brainer in my, in my eyes. And so the way, um, yeah, and so what makes this possible is the software infrastructure uh, that enables uh, these sort of projects. Um, and so in our lab, we've actually built like a uh, substantial software infrastructure uh, for managing uh, the full life cycle of these human the loop uh, projects. So everything from ingesting raw data, keeping track of like metadata, tracking labels, um, you know, preparing uh, images and labels for crowdsourcing jobs, um, training models, deploying models. Um, we have software tools now that that literally touch every um, aspect of this uh, of this process, and because we have these uh, software tools, uh, that is what enables um, the scalable approach to data set construction. Okay, um, and so with that, I think um, I am done, and I will stop talking. Um, so I have to give a huge thanks to everybody in my lab um, who has contributed uh, has contributed to uh, uh, the work I presented today, and then also a huge thanks to uh, different lab members whose work I, I didn't have time to highlight. Um, and I also have to give a thanks to uh, Michelangelo, uh, uh, to collaborators of Michelangelo, um, Liat Karen, Long Kai, um, Yi Song Yu, and then also Eric Osterman on um, the Cloud Posse. And then lastly, I'll thank different uh, sources of funding, uh, most notably 
Bailey, the Reed Allen Foundation, uh, the Pew uh, Charitable Trust, uh, the Susan E. Riley Foundation, and then also the Gordon uh, Betty Moore Foundation and the, and the Sherlin K. Kersey Foundation. Um, also have to give thanks to uh, awards from the NIH and the Paul Allen Family Foundation um, from sub-awards from different, uh, from different, uh, different centers. Um, and then lastly, um, support from uh, internal programs at Caltech. Um, and so with that, I will stop um, talking and open the floor to questions. Thanks so much for that amazing talk. You really showed us a really beautiful story of how you filled those gaps and what was needed for these deep learning models from building up the databases to the labeling to actually the segmentation. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Thank you so much for sharing all of this absolutely wonderful research. I'm new to computational modeling, and it's very interesting to see the wide variety of different things yeah. that can be applied to. Thank you. Yeah, I would say like in the in the broader context of like computational biology, I'd say a lot of what I've been presenting um, today are sort of like the computational primitives that's that are required to prove to take to take go from like raw data to something where you actually can start modeling, right? So if you wanted, if you let's say like you're interested in modeling uh, gene regulatory networks and you're collecting, you know, seek fish data um, to look at like different changes of gene expression in different um, in different conditions, you know, you can't start with just like a raw image of cells and a raw image of spots, right? What you really need are gene expression tables for every uh, for every cell. Um, th these sort of methods are going to enable folks to just, you know, bypass the, you know, issue of, okay, what do I do with the raw data? And then, you know, directly hand you, you know, the interpretable version, which is, you know, the gene expression table that you can then go and use for like all, all of the modeling efforts. Um, I say like, I, you know, I, I did my PhD in like, uh, in biophysics. And so I'd say like, there is this, you know, tradition in biophysics where, you know, you sort of do everything involved in the measurement, right? So you like design the experiments, you collect the data, you figure out how to, you know, analyze it. And part of the analysis is like, okay, there might be like some like physical framework that you want to apply, but you have to figure out like how to extract those variables that you're trying to measure from the raw data, right? Um, and I say like from that experience, you know, cause I, I spent like, I spent many, many hours um, as a graduate student, you know, sort of figuring out like, you know, how to, how to do this for the, you know, sorts of, experiments that I, uh, that I was like responsible for. And I'd say like, you know, sometimes they're just like, you know, like screw it, I'll just analyze it manually because I just need the answer like right now. Um, and that, that works for, you know, a PhD um, sometimes. Uh, but if you're trying to really think about like, okay, well, how can I scale? Um, then that's where you really need the algorithms um, because it's just not possible, or I'd say it's, it's not, you know, impossible because we've been doing it for like forever, um, but it's not ideal um, as a community to have everybody you know, always doing like this sort of uh, this sort of work, and so we can think about how to automate some of these uh, some of these things away using like what these uh, you know these new algorithms can do. I think there's really just a potential to just like you know drastically scale up like what everybody um, is doing. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. I have one question. Yes. Uh, do you possibly see these types of um, looking at sort of the visual cell segmentation uh, work, scaling that up, being integrated with looking at sort of also sequence um, and starting to get predictions that sort of combine that sequence aspect with these uh, images that you would be processing at a large scale? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'd say like the the, the broader vision um, that we've had, um, is I like to call them like integrated measurements. Um, and so these are measurements that integrate different aspects um, of, or sorry, measurements that measure different aspects um, of cellular uh, cellular behavior. Um, so absolutely, uh, right. So like one thing that we're working on in our in our lab right, right now is you know we have different live cell reporters that report on you know immune signaling pathways and metabolic signaling pathways. Um, we can perform you know the multiplexed uh, fish experiments you know fairly uh, fairly well now, um, and we're. You know, so there's a potential to generate these uh, these data sets where you have like both signaling uh, activity and then you have like multiplexed endpoint like gene expression, um, and so we're you know we're busy you know trying to like 
you know, actually perform those measurements, um, in, excuse me, um, in human macrophages, uh, being able to interpret like the raw imaging data. And again, like, you know, go from like, hey, I've got movies and I've got spots, you know, give me, you know, signaling traces and, you know, gene expression tables, you know, that's what these methods are going to be able to do. Um, and if you want to measure, you know, okay, like, you know, hundred cells that, you know, maybe you don't, uh, maybe you don't need it. Um, but if you're trying to measure, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands that, you know, which you, you need to do to, you know, if you want to like generate statistics for dynamic, uh, dynamic processes, um, then yeah, these methods are almost like essential. Great. Thank you for your insight. All right. So I have a quick question. So first off, really fascinating talk. I was curious, can these models be generalized to 3D images such as Z stacks? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you can absolutely do, uh, and we have done uh, three dimensional segmentation. Um, the challenge there is mostly a, a data, again, like it's a data problem, right? It's not that you can't uh, build machine learning methods that can do the segmentation. Um, it's that, you know, do you have, you know, enough data, you, enough three dimensional data that's one representative of what most people want to be able to do? Um, and that, and the two has actually been um, labeled. Um, that I think is really is is missing, um, and generating that is going to be like really hard because like the I, I would say well, it's not impossible, um, but the, there's just a wide variety of challenges. Um, the differences in acquisition parameters um, I'd say is probably like the, the biggest one. Um, different microscopes, different um, Z stack, uh, different resolutions from uh, in X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then also like different things that people are uh, imaging, different markers. Um, but it's, it's definitely possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and folks have shown that you can you know, do 3D segmentation you know, fairly, uh, fairly well. Um, but if you want like a general model that sort of operates like how Mesmer operates, um, then there I think the missing piece is going to be the data. Well, Other questions? Yeah, I guess my the last thing I was really curious about is that these tools that you described sounds like it takes a lot of different like niche techniques from you know the software engineering side to yeah. you know the biology. So can you talk about how you help to like facilitate those conversations within your lab so you have good crosstalk and come out with a beautiful tool like that? Yeah, yeah. Um... So there's a diverse, it, it, yeah, you're absolutely right that, you know, performing work like this requires like a diverse, uh, both a diverse skill set, um, but also a diverse uh, group of people. Um, and so I would say, you know, one thing that we've done um, is that for the folks who, so one, yeah, as I've uh, showed in my talk, like we have like software engineers who are you know, sort of around our lab, um, you know, as a, as a, I don't want to say like permanent presence, um, but like they're, like they're there. And so they're part of like the, the culture, right? Um, and they're also, they also serve as like a resource for students uh, who are, you know, sort of building like these algorithms, these methods, um, so that like you're thinking more, you're thinking beyond just, okay, I need to get an algorithm to work, um, but more like, okay, one, how can I do like my algorithm development in a sustainable way using, you know, good software engineering practices? Um, but two, once I'm done with the algorithm development, you know, how can I, you know, how can I do the software engineering work that's required to like make it, uh, make it available? Um, and so we were fortunate in our lab to have a really talented software engineer, William Graff, um, you know, spend the last three years with us. He just recently left, um, but uh, his presence, um, you know, sort of left, you know, some institutional knowledge. Um, well, well, we also have like other, uh, another software engineer, uh, Tom Doherty, who's still, uh, who's, uh, who's been in our lab as well. Um, but his presence sort of, you know, just set the culture that, you know, like, hey, you know, if you're doing like computational methods development in the Van Allen lab, then there are certain practices that you need to abide by. Um, and there's a certain way in which you need to, uh, you need to do the work. Um, so I think that's like one thing that's been like very, uh, very useful. Um, just having like you know software engineers like present in the lab um, and you know making like that expertise like available. Um, I would say you know what's 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 nice about deep learning is that because uh, because there's been investment um, by like the technology companies you know uh, Facebook and Google and whatnot into like the deep learning uh, uh, frameworks so like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch and whatnot. Uh, it does make it easier to do like the methods development um, substantially, substantially so. Um, and what's also nice is that, you know, if you have something that works in the form of like, say like a TensorFlow model, you know, 
you have a you have a you basically have a format to like export it in this like hey you know someone else can actually take this um, and use it uh, sort of uh, sort of way um, and so if you have like the you know the cloud infrastructure you know like what like what we built um, it makes it like pretty um, pretty I don't want to say it's easy but it's like relatively straightforward to like go from okay I've got an algorithm to hey I've got like this accessible um, piece of software it's like literally like this uh, you know like this model server and if you have a new model you want to make available you know you take out one model and put another one uh, put another one in. Um, and so I say that's something that's been uh, sort of just like enabled by like the, you know, the times that we're in and, you know, like how these, uh, how these different methods um, work. Um, I'd say like uh, intellectual flexibility um, on part of the students is another, um, is another thing. Um, and so there are students who came to my lab um, as experimentalists and, you know, for, you know, one reason or another, they got interested in like the machine learning work and they, you know, avail themselves to like the expertise that we have um, and the presence of the software, uh, software engineers. And they, you know, added that to like their, uh, to like their tool set um, as far as like what they're able to do uh, scientifically. Um, and having them, uh, you know, sort of engage in that work has just been like amazing because, you know, there's, you know, there are nuances with, you know, data and measurements that, you know, you sort of only get when you're um, at the bench um, doing experiments. Um, so yeah, I'd say like those are sort of like the three things I think like have enabled us to do this. Um, intellectual flexibility on part of the students, um, you know, having software engineers um, sort of present to spread the spread the knowledge, um, and then also, you know, just like the the times that we're in and having, um, you know, the compute the software frameworks um, be flexible enough so that it's you know easy to make different methods um, available. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks again so much for giving this talk and. Yeah, I learned a lot. I'm going to run back to my lab and tell all my uh, my lab mates about this tool they can use instead of manually drawing stuff around their cells now. <laughs> so, yeah. if, um, is there... um, I would just add that uh, deepcell.org um, is where you can find all the software tools um, that I talked about today. Nice. Is there a way that um, maybe some of us can follow up with you, perhaps through email? Just send me, an, send me an email. I'm super, super accessible. And I would just say like, this is general advice for uh, communicating with faculty members. Uh, if at first you don't um, hear from us, try again. Uh, yeah. I would say like the, the probability of response from Professor Ann Vallon has much more to do with like, am I at my desk when the email comes in? Um, then did I, did I like intentionally like ignore an email? Um, you know, sometimes if you're not there, blink, and then, you know, email just like ends up in a pile of like 50, um, 50 other emails. Um, but yeah, uh, Van Valen at caltech.edu. Um, and yeah, uh, if folks have any questions um, or want advice um, or comments, I'm more than happy to field them. All right. Thanks again. And thanks for everyone for coming. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>